Good morning. So, where we left off last time was with your general inability to corroborate the veracity of the rotational inertia we measured of the bicycle wheel. Does that encapsulate where we are? Yes, it does. Yeah. Flippin' physics. I guess so. On the board, I have summarized what we determined last time. We drew the free body diagram of the forces acting on the wheel and the mass hanging. We summed the torques on just the wheel with the axis of rotation at the axle of the wheel, and the positive torque direction shown in the free body diagram. We used the net torque equation to solve for the rotational inertia of the wheel. We realized we needed the force of tension in the string and the angular acceleration of the wheel. To determine the force of tension in the string, we summed the forces in the y direction on the hanging mass, remembering that down was positive according to our positive torque direction. We also took measurements and determined the angular acceleration of the bicycle wheel. The rotational inertia or moment of inertia of the wheel we determined to be 0.147 kilogram meters squared. Billy, remind me, what was your question? How do we know if 0.147 kilogram meters squared is a reasonable number for the rotational inertia of the bicycle wheel? Yeah. In order to answer your question, do you remember that about their centers of mass and long cylindrical axes, the equations for the rotational inertias of spheres and cylinders were always a fraction times the mass of the object times the radius of the object squared. Oh yeah, the rotational inertia of a thin hoop about its cylindrical axis is the mass of the hoop times the radius of the hoop squared. And the rotational inertia of a solid disk about its cylindrical axis is one half the mass of the disk times the radius of the disk squared. Correct. And I think you would agree that while this bicycle wheel is neither a thin hoop nor a solid disk, it does fall somewhere in between the two. In other words, its rotational inertia should be a fraction times its mass times its radius squared. And that fraction should be somewhere between one half and one. What do you all think that fraction should be? Looks like maybe three fourths. I'd say maybe four fifths. I actually think it's probably less than three fourths, maybe two thirds. Uh Okay, so the exact fraction is actually not that important, but regardless, you do see how the rotational inertia of the wheel should be a fraction times the mass of the wheel times the radius of the wheel squared with that fraction somewhere between one half and one, correct? Yes. Sure. Okay. Great, so let's take three fourths as a reasonable estimate for now. We already know the radius of the wheel is 0.332 meters. I measured the mass of the wheel to be 1.96 kilograms. I have plugged in the variable x for the fraction and solved for it. Therefore, the fraction should equal the rotational inertia of the wheel divided by the quantity mass of the wheel times the radius of the wheel squared. Substituting in our numbers gives us 0.679505 for x, or that the rotational inertia of the bicycle wheel equals 0.680 times the mass of the wheel times the radius of the wheel squared. Now, I know 0.680 is not quite 3 fourths. However, I think you could agree we have shown that the number we got for the rotational inertia of the bicycle wheel is reasonable. I can agree with that. Okay. I have another question. Why did we sum the torques acting on just the wheel? Could we not have summed the torques acting on the wheel and the hanging mass at the same time? The two torques caused by the force of tension would then cancel one another out. That seems like it would have been easier. Okay, Bo, let's take a look at that. Bo, I am assuming this is what you're talking about. If we sum the torques acting on both the wheel and the hanging mass, then we have the torque caused by the force of tension acting on the wheel minus the torque caused by the force of tension acting on the hanging mass plus the torque caused by the force of gravity acting on the hanging mass. The torque caused by the force of tension acting on the hanging mass is negative because it, was it would cause the wheel to rotate opposite our positive torque direction. Bo, you said that because the force of tension acting on both ends of the string is the same, then both force of tension torques will cancel one another out, and we will just end up with the torque caused by the force of gravity acting on the hanging mass being equal to the rotational inertia times angular acceleration. Is that a good summary of your question, Bo? Yeah. Okay, then I have a few questions. First, around what axis of rotation did we sum the torques? 
the axle of the wheel. Then what is the rotational inertia of that hanging mass about that axis of rotation? What is the rotational inertia of the hanging mass about the axle of the wheel? I do not really understand the question. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. Please realize the rotational inertia in the rotational form of Newton's second law refers to the rotational inertia of everything you are summing the torques on. Second question, Bo. How can we say the torques caused by the two forces of tension are equal and opposite and cancel one another out? I mean, have we even defined the R vector for the torque caused by the force of tension acting on the hanging mass? We have not really defined that in this problem yet. I suppose we could define it. I agree. However, we have not done that yet. So we cannot simply assume that the two torques caused by the forces of tension would then cancel one another out. I get it. We cannot sum the torques on the wheel and the hanging mass at the same time. Actually, when we get to the rotational form of Newton's second law that includes angular momentum, we will be able to. However, not yet. Mr. P? Yes, Bobby? I, I hear what you are saying. However, I feel like the force of gravity and the force of tension, which both act on the hanging mass, should be the same. I mean, look at the free body diagram. So we should just be able to use the force of gravity instead of the force of tension, right? Interesting question, Bobby. Um, let's add a part B to this problem. Part B. Determine the force of tension in the string while the wheel is angularly accelerating. Billy, please solve the problem. Well, we already have an equation we can use to solve for the force of tension. It's the one from when we summed the torques on the wheel. It is rotational inertia equals the radius of the wheel times the force of tension, both divided by the angular acceleration of the wheel. Uh, we can rearrange that to solve for the force of tension, which equals rotational inertia times angular acceleration, both divided by radius, or zero point, um, hold up, zero point one four six eight zero zero uh, times three point nine four one four seven eight, all divided by zero point three three two, uh, which equals uh, one point seven four two seven nine three, or one point seven four newtons with three significant digits. Uh, actually, when we summed the forces on the hanging mass, we also got an equation for the force of tension. Force of tension equals mass times the quantity acceleration due to gravity minus wheel radius times angular acceleration. Uh, that equals 0 0.205 times the quantity uh, 9.81 minus 0.332 times 3.941478, uh, which equals, hey, I, get the, I got the exact same answer Billy got. And that's cool. Who knew? Right. And notice that before I release the wheel, the acceleration of the hanging mass is zero. That is when the magnitude of the force of tension equals the magnitude of the force of gravity, and they both equal 2.01 newtons with three significant digits. And those forces are things we can measure. I have placed a wireless force sensor at the end of the string and adjusted the hanging mass so the total hanging mass, including the wireless force sensor, equals 0.205 kilograms, which is the same hanging mass we had previously. You can see before I release the wheel, the force sensor, which is measuring the force of tension in the string, gives us a reading of roughly 1.9 newtons. And while the wheel is accelerating, the force measurement is reduced to roughly 1.6 newtons. Now, I know that is not exactly what we predicted. However, I would consider being off by roughly one-tenth of a newton to be, to be pretty darn good. And yes, I did calibrate the force sensor. Uh, plus, we measured the force differential between at rest and accelerating to be 1.9 minus 1.6 or 0.3 newtons, which matches our predicted force differential of 2.0 minus 1.7 newtons. I would consider this good enough to sing the physics works. The physics works. Uh huh. Uh huh. The physics works. Yeah, Mr. P. The physics works. Uh huh. Uh huh. The physics works. The physics works. Uh huh. Uh huh. The physics works. <laughs> Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.